Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, I believe some people are on their way, but if we could have a roll call, please. Councilmember Dominguez. Set. Hart. Hodgkiss. Here. Murillo. Here. Rouse. White. Here. Mayor Snyder. Here. Okay, I don't see any public comment for non-budget issues, so uh, Mr. Samario, it's all yours. Thank you, Madam Mayor, members of the council. I am Bob Samario, the finance director. So today we are gonna wrap up the budget presentations with the administrative departments. And we're going to start with finance. Finance, as you know, includes um, the solid waste fund, which we've already presented. Um, the other fund that we are as part of finance is self-insurance. So that'll be at the end of this presentation. Mark Howard will present that. Um, but we're going to start with the general fund portion of our department um, and include also in that the general, what we call general government, that's capital, debt service, those kinds of things. I want to just first thank all the finance managers who are here and supervisors. I'd like for them to stand, if you don't mind. I didn't tell me I would do this, but they all work very hard, as you know, and I really appreciate them. <laughs> and I want to, and I want to particularly, yay. I want to particularly recognize Michael Pease, who will be giving the presentation today. He's to my left. He is our budget manager, but he's the one that coordinates the budget process, so he does a great job. And I know folks around the, the city really appreciate what he does, and I, I'm pleased to have him in our, on our team. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Michael Pease, our budget manager. Thank you, Bob. Uh, Mr. Samaro, for the kind words. Uh, uh, Madam Mayor, members of Council, uh, Michael Pease, budget manager. I'm here to uh, present the finance department general fund budget um, and then briefly the general government section of the budget document um, so the information we'll be talking about today is on page starting on page g uh, 111 in your budget document if you want to follow along but the presentation covers it so um, the finance department the general fund uh, particularly but uh, the general fund as a whole is a well general fund is a central service uh, department a central support um, its function is to handle the core financial affairs of departments so they can focus on their core missions. So we really support them in, in um, some of the back office uh, affairs. This is a quick look at um, the various programs, the visions really within the finance department. Um, you can see at the top uh, we have administration, um, we have budget management, uh, which I head up. We have general services um, headed up by Bill Horning, our general services manager, treasury, um, and I'll get into some of what these divisions do a, a little bit later in the presentation. Treasury headed up by Julie Nemus, our treasury manager, accounting, our accounting manager, Jennifer Tomaszewski, environmental services, um, our new uh, so, um, solid waste manager, Renee Eyerly, and the risk management operation uh, run by Mark Howard, our risk manager. And that's um, 47 and a half FTEs across uh, three funds and 17 programs. So kind of getting into each of the various divisions. Um, our first division is the Treasury, Man uh, Treasury Division. Um, this division is responsible for collecting all of the uh, city's revenues, um, recording those, handling the investments um, of those funds in accordance with city policy. Um, administering the various tax and permit collections um, in accordance with the municipal code and setting out all the utility bills, handling all the billing um, they also handle. And that's headed up by our treasury manager. Four programs, 15.33 uh, FTEs. Our next division is the accounting division. And this um, operation maintains all the um, accounting records, including the accounting system, uh, tracks all the city revenues and expenditures, um, prepares all the uh, reporting uh, for city, state, and federal uh, requirements, processes uh, city payroll, and uh, sends out all the, um, the basically handles uh, the payment of all city bills on behalf of departments. And that's uh, a little over nine FTEs and three programs. Um, General services um, ensures that purchases comply with the city policy and purchasing code. 
um, to really encourage competition and avoid conflicts of interest. Um, they also maintain our uh, central warehouse, um, including uh, specialized inventory for various uh, city departments. And they sort and deliver all the inner office and uh, United States Postal Service mail. And that's uh, seven positions and three programs. And the last division, well, the last general fund division is administration. And that um, operation basically provides administrative support to all the other finance uh, divisions and also uh, support to departments, the city administrator, city council, on all uh, financial matters. Issues, um, it manages the issuance of debt and develops the annual city budget. And that's three, a little more than 3.6 FTEs and two programs. Now I'll get into kind of a financial overview of the entire, you know, general fund uh, finance department budget. So this is kind of a, a quick look at our um, proposed expenditures. Um, similar to the other presentations you've seen from departments, you know, we have the, uh, we're starting with the FY17 amended budget uh, on, the, on the top left there, and then it's moving across to the recommended, the proposed FY18 budget, and then the change from the amended 17 budget to the uh, recommended 18 budget, and then that percent change. And then the various expenditure categories uh, going down the left side. So you can see our, our budget is relatively stable um, from the 17 budget to 18. There are a few changes I'll, I'll mention. You can see in salary and benefits, very modest increase. Um, we, this is one category where we did reduce a little bit for our 1% reduction. And then we also have just regular growth in salary benefit costs. And so that's why that's going up a little bit. So, uh, supplies and services, this is the category where most of our 1% reductions were contained. And so that's why it's going down. You see a 10% decrease, 50, uh, almost 55,000. Allocated costs, this was a larger decrease. And what this reflects is information technology, uh, one of our internal service funds, they are, um, every year they reevaluate how they charge for the services they provide. And one of the, uh, the major changes they made this year is uh, looking at how they allocate uh, the service for enterprise applications. And they're seeing a, a higher demand from other departments uh, for uh, application support. And so historically, the, that service has been allocated to finance and human resources primarily because those are the departments that benefit from the financial, uh, the accounting system. Um, but since they're seeing more demand from, for, from other departments for applications, they're beginning to kind of allocate that out to those departments to reflect that change in, in demand. So we're seeing a reduction because we we're not paying as much because we're a smaller piece of the pie now for that service for enterprise application support. Um, and then special projects, um, that's also decreasing mainly because we have some one time um, actuarial studies that we do every two years. And so we're not going to be, um, we're not um, including those in our 18 budget. We did those in 17. We'll do them again in 19, but we're not doing them in 18. Um, and then the rest, again, really stable. So that's kind of a look at expenditures. Moving on to revenues. Again, we don't have a lot of uh, departmental revenues, but this is just a quick look at what we do have. Um, we have some licenses and permits, miscellaneous licenses and permits, um, kind of smaller permits, you know, for kind of one day and table permits. Um, the late uh, penalty fee, there's no change in that. We have our uh, business improvement district administration fee for administering the parking and business improvement district uh, billing. We also have um, credit card rebates. And this is, we're continuing to see, um, we're continuing to roll out the use of credit cards for smaller purchases. Um, across the city and as we do that and there's a higher volume of usage then we're seeing more of a rebate um, back to the city for, for um, that credit card usage. So we get a rebate back from the credit card company and Mr. Samara can get into that if you have questions. And, and the rest, like I said, very stable, um, not a large significant change in the revenue side. Now I'll get into kind of programmatic highlights. Um, just 
So these are some, some of the key work efforts that we're um, looking at in fiscal year 18. We're gonna be reaching out to departments with surveys and outreach to identify areas for improvement in the services we provide. We'll issue RFPs, uh, request for proposal for banking services, and fully implement a new banking service provider by December um, 2018. We'll be upgrading the utility billing system um, to the latest version and conduct, also conduct an RFP for a new accounts receivable system. What we, what we have now is, is just not functional, um, fully functional. We'd like to get more out of that um, and continue to document our policies and procedures so that we can um, have more stability if there is turnover and, and change in staffing. So with that, I'll, uh, I'll take some questions, any questions you may have on the general fund finance department budget um, before getting into general government. Thank you, Madam Mayor. So Mr. Pease, thank you. So um, the business license fee revenue, that's not the chart you just showed us? Or it is? Uh, that's correct. It is not. That is a non, what we call a non-departmental revenue. It's a, it's a general fund revenue. It's not specifically tied to the finance department uh, particularly. It is, um, it is a, uh, a general tax that the general fund benefits from. Okay. I guess I'm just wondering, what, uh, I thought we brought in more money on, on just our general business license fee. That's reflected somewhere else in the presentation? Yeah. That's. Oh, okay. Okay. That was all part of kind of our general uh, general fund revenues. Like we, we presented that to finance committee, all of our major general fund revenues. And so that's, that's where that's included. Okay, super. Thanks. Thank you. I'll, do, I'll just mention that really this is focused just on the revenues that the, that the finance department, uh, what we classify as departmental revenues that are out, that are allocated specifically to the finance department. And you know, various departments have those, but there's also the non-departmental, which are the big ones that we allocate just to the general fund as a whole. And so every de general fund department benefits from those, such as sales tax, property tax, you know, the business license tax, et cetera. Thank you. Okay. Moving along to general government. So we have a general government program and this is really uh, in the general fund. There's, there's a couple of things going on here. Um, we have a general government program within the general fund. And so that, that is kind of a little bit of a catch all for those things that are not really allocated to a specific department. You know, often transfers, the appropriate reserve, um, you know, debt service payments, those kind of things. And so that's what you're seeing up here. We also have a, a post employment benefits fund that we also uh, consider as kind of general government. It's, it's not allocated to a specific department, um, but it is nonetheless uh, something that we need to include in the budget. And so we include that in our general government section of the, of the budget document. So that's what you're seeing here. So looking at this uh, slide, you can see the revenues, the interfund reimbursement revenue there. Um, the 1.8 million, that is the reimbursement, the interfund transfer really we received from the various city departments to fund that post-employment benefits fund. And what that fund does is it funds the, um, the, an allocation, a premium if you will, to fund uh, final, uh, final pay cash outs for sick leave, um, retiree medical, and for vacation cash outs. These are you know benefits that have been um, uh, the employees have had. And so that fund is meant to provide more stability uh, to those costs. And so we, we charge the departments a small premium and then collect the money in that fund. And so as those costs are incurred, the fund pays those rather than it being hit by the departments. So that's the revenue side. You can see on the expenditures, uh, there's also the 1.8 million, which offsets that. Um, uh, we budget you know, revenues equal to expense. Obviously that's not the way it actually happens. You know. It, but nonetheless, we want to um, budget the, a sufficient revenue to cover the expense and then just anticipate, you know, some amount will, will be incurred. And then we just monitor that and adjust the allocation as needed going forward. Uh, so um, what did we spend last year on that? How would you compare that to our spend of la at least? I, I appreciate this is going forward. But uh, so looking backwards, what did we have going out? 
you know, it, it really, you know, I haven't, I don't have those numbers directly in front of me. Okay. Maybe, maybe Mr. Well, maybe, Marta. and just some time offline or whatever. Yeah, and I th we have it in here. I can, okay. we can pull it out of the document. Um, so last year we spent 2.6 million in, in claims, in claims for those three items. The, right. Entire medical vacation, yeah. Exactly. So we're uh, we're we're funding two thirds or three quarters of that in this in this our, our past spend, and then the rest of that would have come out of the individual departments. Well, yeah, th let me jump yeah. in real quick. So, Madam Mayor, Council Member, Mr. White, um, so we collect an amount which we think is going to be needed every year, but we're, we're never right on. It no, goes I up and appreciate down. that. Last year was an unusual year, in my opinion, that we spent more than we brought in. But my expectation is that we'll see dips and you know, so the ebbs and flows in this. Our estimate overall, overall in time is about 1.8. We know that we're trending where we're not getting enough money put in there, so we're kind of running a deficit, and we'll be adjusting that over time. Yeah, and, <laughs> and it would be helpful to have that. Per, you, you have that perspective, doing it year after year. It, it would be helpful to have that perspective, to share that perspective sure. with the, the decision makers. Sometime. Sure. So that's, that's the major component of the general government. We also have our capital transfers um, that go out to our capital outlay fund, the, the fund, uh, what do we call our general fund capital uh, projects, which you'll see in the, in the budget document and under the capital program. Those are the first section of projects. Uh, and we also have other transfers. And so you can see, uh, I'll just note a few of these major changes. Um, the, for the debt service, you can see that's declining because we just paid off the municipal uh, certi certificates of participation in fiscal year 2017. So we're not making that payment going forward. That's great news. We don't have that debt anymore. And so that's going away. Um, and then you'll see there's some uh, small shifts in the capital transfers. You know, there's some ins and outs. You know, we uh, every year we fund a little bit of, so we have some smaller transfers in fiscal year 17, which we don't have in 18. But the major change really is um, at the end of the year, we take the general fund surplus and we transfer that over to the capital fund. And that's really what you're seeing here is the major decrease is we don't see that in the budget because it's, it hasn't happened yet. We're gonna, we're gonna do that at the end of the year, whatever surplus is incurred uh, in the general fund, we'll transfer that. So that's the major shift you see there. Uh, um, what is the what was the certificate of part, uh, participation for? Those were bonds COPs issued, I think, in the late '80s, and they were used to finance. They were split between the Gulf Fund and the improvements that were made to the building on Garden Street, 630 Garden Street. So the major improvements there, and another portion of that, which is not reflected here, but also in the Gulf Fund for the improvements to the clubhouse. <laughs> So with that, I'm happy to answer any questions you have about the general government uh, section and the budget before uh, getting into the self-insurance self fund. Any other questions? Nope, go ahead. Thank you, I'll be turning it over to you. Quick switch. Good morning, Madam Mayor and Council Members. Mark Howard, I'm the risk manager. My task this morning is to walk you through the self-insurance fund and uh, talk to you about those items. We will be going over four different sections in this presentation. First, a, an overview of the risk management division. Then we'll look at both appropriations and revenues, uh, a review of our uh, self-insurance fund reserve balances, and then a, a look at the performance and work objectives for the coming fiscal year. So the risk management division, here's our organizational chart, represents four programs, and those include administrative operations, the general liability, the workers' compensation program, and our occupational safety and health program, uh, utilizing a little over four full-time equivalents to accomplish uh, our chief goals of the year. So the workers' compensation program, quick definition here is scheduled to provide benefits to injured employees in accordance with federal and California laws and to coordinate the return to work of those individuals at an appropriate time. Uh, the liability program investigates any incident that happens on city property and adjusts the damage claims that may result from those. Our 
Occupational Safety and Health Program assists the operating departments to ensure a safe work environment for all our uh, workforce and through training, periodic medical screening and safety analysis and coordinate our, our injury and illness prevention program training uh, throughout the year. And then our administrative operations is to oversee the entire division and to uh, administer our specialty insurance programs that we'll get into in a little bit later. So that's a quick overview of what the self-insurance fund does. And so what I thought I would do is present a little bit of background so that there, you can see some context with the numbers that we're going to be presenting as we move forward. So this first slide looks at the claim frequency in the workers' compensation program. This is the number of claims reported each fiscal year with a 10-year look. As you can see, the numbers of claims seems to have plateaued at around 150 claims a year. That's good news overall for the organization because that's about a 40% decrease over the historical average of 250 claims. The city began its self-insurance program in the late 1970s, 1978, and, and this shows a 40% <coughs> decrease over the last 10 years. And when we look at the next slide here, which is the cash flow on a fiscal year basis, you'll see that in the last several years, even though we've had fewer claims, our cash out the door is increasing dramatically and this is part of the the background that I want to share with you before we get into revenues and expenditures and so when we switch gears to the liability program we see that that those claims are a little bit all over the board but what I want to focus on are the last three years where we're seeing increased uh, claim frequency it's up over the last three years but it has not reached our historic average of 165 claims. We're close, but it's, it's still increasing. Then when we compare the liability claim frequency with the payments on a cash flow basis over the last 10 fiscal years, you can see some spikes. And those spikes are things that when we ask an actuary to identify what we need both in cash and reserves, these are the things that they look at is where are your claim payments going and so as you can see between those two programs, we are seeing some increases in costs. So with that, I want to now turn to what we're going to be doing for fiscal year 18. The self-insurance fund is going to uh, bring in about $8 million in revenues. There are four main buckets that those come in. The smallest bucket you see there is interest income and then the other three larger buckets are the premiums that we charge the operating departments to uh, obtain funds to, to operate those programs. So when we look closer at those, you'll see that workers' compensation premiums are up significantly. That kind of trends along with what we've seen in the cash out the door over the last several years. Liability insurance premiums are down slightly. Uh, and then the insurance premiums for property and the other miscellaneous are um, up a little bit. The interest income is fairly flat, so that gives us the $8 million in revenues that we are uh, planning to generate. When we look at our expenses, we are going to spend just slightly less than $8 million. So we've got almost a balanced budget. We're gonna have a slight surplus, and I'll talk about that in a few more slides. But the the biggest piece of the pie, as you can see, is the, the claims payments for both workers' compensation claims, a little over $3.2 million, and the liability insurance and claims at $1.4 million. Property insurance and the miscellaneous policies are right around $1.3. Um, one thing that is new on this slide, and I want to point out to you, is there is, at the top of the, the pie chart, a $125,000 entry for an RMIS. That's a risk management information system. We are planning to purchase new software to help us operate our, our fund um, and plan to implement that sometime in the late half, later half of fiscal year 18. Uh, that's a new expense. And so when we look at the numbers directly, you'll see that you know, salaries and benefits are tracking what this citywide is doing, a little less than 2%. Our, Materials and supplies are up a little bit, but when you get to the workers' compensation claims and insurance, you're going to see the large jump of 25% increase. 
this is something that the industry as a whole in California is experiencing. It's not unique to, to Santa Barbara. Um, the other items are all about the same, but, and you do, I did call out separately the, the RMIS system. Um, so now we turn to our self-insurance fund reserves. We do an actuarial study every two years. We hire an outside firm to look at our loss history, our claims payments, and tell us what we need for cash to operate on the fiscal year basis as well as to uh, fund for claims in the future, what we call incurred but not reported, or IBNR. And the actuary and its last three studies has continually increased those requirements. The study that was completed in fiscal year 16 suggested that we have $12.4 million in reserves in our fund. As of July 1st of 2016, the fund actually had $6.7 million. That's a significant amount of money on hand. It does not reach the $12.4 million that the actuary recommends. We have a shortfall of $5.7 million. We have seen that our costs out the door are continue to escalate, so we have chosen to adjust the amount of money that we are spending on actual claims up a little higher so that we can try and balance our our own books internally in that fashion and we can turn our attention to the reserve shortfall in the next budget cycle uh, otherwise we, we would be asking the departments to pay more money to us making it more difficult for them to provide the operations that you need them to do and so what does it really look like this proposed budget there's an increase in premiums for workers' compensation, for property insurance. There's a small decrease in the liability premiums. And the, the increase in claim expenses for workers' comp and liability programs. What that means is for fiscal year 18 and 19, we will have a modest surplus. $4,400 is the projected surplus, uh, which is in contrast to the current fiscal year where we budgeted a surplus of just shy of $400,000 to try and address the, the shortfall. We are on track to meet or exceed that surplus for fiscal 17. Uh, so going forward, we're gonna try and, and balance our claim payments so that we're not dipping into reserves to make those, those payments. So what, are we, what am I seeing going forward? Upwards pressure on specific premiums, workers' compensation, costs are going up statewide, especially in the area for public agencies. Uh, we've seen those costs going up as we showed in the graphs earlier. We're also seeing that excess insurance premiums for both workers' compensation and liability for municipalities are going up in double-digit figures for fiscal 18 and as far as we can project out in the next two years. We are seeing minor fluctuations for some of our specialty insurance programs. Those include airport, uh, property and earthquake, watercraft, we own several boats, um, and what we call our crime policy, which is a policy that is required by California law for certain public officials to have a bond or a policy against embezzlement or fraud. And so we have had to have used that policy in a couple of times in the past few years, and that uh, was able to provide us with funding when we did have a loss in one of our departments. Um, that loss did create us to have a higher claim frequency, which meant that the insurance policy for that going forward was going to go up, and it, we have seen that. <clears throat> so the P3 highlights, what are we gonna be doing work-wise in the next year? So for the administrative operations, we're gonna implement that new RMIS program. We are currently reviewing uh, proposals and we'll be selecting something soon and bringing it back to council early in fiscal 18 for your review and approval. Uh, in the workers' comp program, we use a third-party administrator to provide most of the services after a, an employee files a, a work injury claim. That uh, service provider's contract will be expiring at the end of fiscal 18, so we're gonna issue an RFP to see if we wanna continue or change services. We also conduct 
claim reviews with that claims adjuster on a semi-annual basis, and we're going to develop guidelines for reporting claims, what we call after hours. When my staff is not in the office, how can the operating departments get something done on an urgent basis? Uh, in the liability program, there's more of uh, updating our policies and procedures, and uh, in the occupational safety and health area, we're going to do our annual facility uh, safety audit and continue coordinating the monthly training. And so with that, we come to our proposed cuts. We talked about our different types of insurance, and the, the recommendation here is to reduce our earthquake coverage, uh, coverage limits. In fiscal year 17, we increased our coverage limits from $50 million in dedicated limits to $75 million. It's important to note that the city owns over 480 different buildings and facilities throughout our, our region, some that you're very familiar with, city hall, police departments, fire stations. Some maybe not so familiar, <coughs> including lift stations for our water system and, and wastewater system. Uh, those values have increased dramatically over the last eight years from $466 million in total insured values to over $520 million. And so we increased our earthquake coverage limits to $75 million for this fiscal year. We are proposing going back to the $50 million de designated limits in fiscal 18, which will save us about $80,000 in insurance premiums. So those are our proposed cuts. And with that, I'll entertain any questions. Mr. White and then Mr. Ross. <clears throat> Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, so back to slide 28. The, the, um, you mentioned, and you, you actually just alluded to one of them, there's, are, there, there are a number of, of these, uh, um, obviously the word insurance shows up one, two, three, four times in that list. Can you describe uh, a little bit about what those uh, insurance policies are? Uh, Mayor, uh, Councilman White, yes, I can. At least the big, I'm just, what are the big ones? So the workers' compensation is for... ...that are reported by our workforce, the city's workforce, for an injury that happens in the course and scope of their employment. The and, so, and so, like, what portion that says claims and insurance, for example, what, is that half claims and half insurance, 10% uh, insurance, 90% claims? So we are self-insured for workers' compensation purposes, and that means we will pay um, all the costs associated with a claim. We buy excess insurance. Okay. When a claim exceeds $750,000, the excess insurance kicks in. So the vast majority of that is for our self-insurance portion. The excess insurance policy for fiscal 18, we estimate to be about 400, 000, just less than $400,000. So, so out of the two, six, or, and then, uh, and then for, three, for two, then? Three, two, the rest will be for actual claims. 400,000, okay. Yes. The and unemployment that's... insurance, that is for those folks who are getting EDD benefits after they've left our employment. That has been fairly constant over the last five years. So that is all reimbursement to Employment Development Department. The liability claims and insurance, our excess insurance portion on that is much bigger piece than the workers' comp. We are self-insured for the first million dollars of each claim. And so the amount there for actual claim payments is $600,000. The balance is for uh, the excess insurance portion. So we have so 800,000, uh, 900,000 kind of thing, okay? And so that coverage, we have $50 million in coverage for general liability purposes. And okay. then under the property insurance, the vast majority of that 1.3 is for property insurance, the for fire, flood, earthquake insurance. The specialty policies also fall into that case, which is airport, watercraft, um, the crime policy, volunteer medical, those in the uh, addition of all those up outside of the property insurance is less than $100,000. The vast majority of that is the property. Okay, so just like property insurance that 
we'd buy out here. I Correct. Mean, in the regular world. Okay. Correct. And that covers all of the general fund, all general fund and enterprise funds and the inner city funds. Wow, it seems low. Okay. All right, and then the next slide on 29, um, the change from, uh, we're, we're, we have uh, the, the insurance folks or actuarial folks want us to have 12 million there and we have six, seven. Um, con could you give some context on that? What in the two years previous was that number 10 million and we had five or? I, I can give you some great context on that. So going back eight years, that number was $6.2 million. Was the required reserve. Was required okay. reserve. So the required we, reserve has doubled in eight years. Correct. Okay. Correct. And over that period of time, our claim costs out the door have gone up dramatically as we saw in that previous slide. So we've been increasing our premiums that we charge for workers' comp and liability claims to the operating departments, but we have not been able to match that need for the, the so reserve requirements. We've always been in, we've been in deficit for these eight years. Correct. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Mayor. <clears throat> Mr. Howard, so when it comes to developing experience modifications for these different job classifications, is that done in-house? Is that done by the third party administrator? Is that something that goes on agency wide with other municipalities? How do we determine what each job category does in terms of their workers' comp rating? Madam Mayor, Councilman Rouse, uh, that actually is done as part of our actuarial study and cost allocation plan. We hire an outside service to do that every two years. And so some of the departments will see that their experience is better than the industry expectations and others are not as good as the industry's expectation. So, but we do hire an outside service to do so that. So then each department has an incentive to control their costs because that will be affecting their budget in terms of their, their, their premium assignment for the upcoming years. That's the idea. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Just following up on Councilmember White's questions about the self-insurance reserve. So the reserve has the requirement from the actuarial that the reserve increase has also tracked almost parallel with the actual claims increasing over that same time period. So you're you're effectively spending the money that would have been spent from reserves on an annual basis through claims. That is correct. And so then that raises the question philosophically of what's the point of the reserve then? Just as a cushion against extraordinary claims? This is the industry standard. They, they talk about, for example, in the workers' comp arena, when somebody has an injury, one of the things, one of the benefits that they're entitled to is medical care for that injury throughout their lifetime. Mm -hmm. So those costs may happen today or they could happen five or ten years from today. So we need to have money set aside to make those payments going forward. Um, one of the reasons that uh, Mr. Samario and I are less concerned about this shortfall in the immediacy is that we have enough cash on hand to continue our operations and work on this as we move forward on an incremental basis without upsetting the total budgetary apple cart that you guys need to, to deal with. So you're looking for an opportunistic year when your claims are below what you have out budgeted for and then you can put that money into the reserves and take those opportunities to rebuild the reserves over time. That is correct. Okay. As I mentioned, we had budgeted for about a $400,000 surplus in fiscal 17 and we're going to roll that surplus toward that shortfall. Okay. And that's our that's our plan. Thank you. M Madam Mayor, can I just jump in real quick just to give some context back in 2005 or 6 we had the reverse situation. We had about $10 million in cash, and we only required to have about six, and that allowed us to give some rebates to the general fund when they were needed, as well as enterprise funds. These things just go in cycles, in sort of 10-year cycles. We're hoping that in time we can start budgeting a little more incrementally and we have better results in, in the future um, to help us close that gap. Okay. Thank you. And then um, just tell me a little bit more about the thinking regarding lowering the earthquake policy coverage. It sounds like you recognize that there's just a big gap in terms of the assets and the exposure that we have and that saving the $80,000 makes more sense as opposed to having the, the coverage? Well, <clears throat> that is a, a cost-benefit analysis that we have to mm -hmm. go through, and, and we were all challenged uh, to come up with proposed cuts that we can um, stomach without going too far, and this was the, the only realistic area that we could 
attempt during this current fiscal year. That doesn't mean that we're going to always be at that level. We may return when, when budgetary allows us to do so. And we, for many years, we've had it at $50 million in 17 this current year. We raised it because we were able to do so without any premium increase. Premiums were just good for us, uh, so it didn't cost us any more. So, but we will get a benefit by lowering it um, by $80,000, as Mark indicated. It's a low probability, high risk event, and you're betting it doesn't happen next year. Right, right. And again, what we're able to cover is about a tenth of what we actually you know, have in assets or values of assets. So it's not like we're coming to $500 million of assets anyways. Right. We look to FEMA, Calima, and, and, and some reserves to make up that difference as well. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we're all done. We'll turn it over to the next department. Administrative Services. Good morning, Madam Mayor, City Council members. I'm Christy Schmidt, Director of Administrative Services. Um, I will be presenting the budget today. It's going to be an a, a abbreviated uh, uh, presentation, both because uh, our, our uh, administrative services budget is fairly simple, and you're all fair, very familiar with the functions that we perform, um, but also because I'm starting to lose my voice, and my presentation partner was called away on a uh, family emergency, so I'm going to try and get through the whole thing myself. So we'll first be going over uh, a really quick overview of our department. Um, I'll talk about the general fund operations, uh, the proposed expenditures and in key initiatives and performance objective for the general fund, and then move on to our inner city services funds, which are information technology related. The Administrative Services Department has uh, three, three major divisions in addition to our administrative program uh, and eight total programs. We have 30.6 full-time equivalent positions. In addition to myself overseeing uh, administration and labor relations, we have Sarah Gorman, our City Clerk Services Manager, who oversees the City Clerk operations as well as the elections. Uh, in human resources, we have Susie Gonzalez, our human resources manager, and she oversees the full spectrum of human resources functions as well as our citywide training programs. Uh, and in information technology, we have Marianne Knight. Uh, she was recently promoted uh, to that position during this last fiscal year. Uh, she oversees uh, the information technology infrastructure uh, program. Uh, she also oversees uh, enterprise applications, which support some of our major uh, multi-department um, uh, software applications, most uh, significantly the financial management system, uh, and also GIS, which is becoming a more and more important uh, part of information technology. Uh, the administrative services budget uh, uh, is uh, divided, it's about 57% uh, in ICS funds um, and uh, the remaining in the human, in the general fund. Um, the total budget is 6.5 million. So we'll go to our general fund operations. Um, for proposed expenditures, um, looking at uh, our amended fiscal year 17 budget and our projected um, expenditures in fiscal year 17, we will underspend our budget, uh, including uh, significant salary and benefit savings due to turnover at the beginning of the year. Uh, in fiscal, 18, fiscal year 18, uh, we'll have a, pardon me, I'm on the wrong page here. cold medication, I apologize. <laughs> uh, in fiscal year uh, 17, we're expecting to underspend our budget by about $132,000 by um, uh, from salary savings from turnover, but also because the expenses for the November 2016 special election for the marijuana ballot measure uh, did not come in as high as we'd expected them to. Um, and in fiscal year 18, we'll have a net increase in expenditures of 132000 in the general fund. Um, those changes are the net of um, 
uh, $23,500 in uh, cuts that we've made to discretionary line items to close the budget back gap, which I'll get into in a little more, more detail on the next slide. We'll also be transferring uh, about 15% uh, of my time uh, as the Administrative Services Director to the ICS Fund for IT, just to more accurately reflect um, the time that I spend uh, managing information technology. Um, so that'll be a reduction in expenditures, general fund expenditures. Um, we will be increasing each year our legal support from Liebert Cassidy Whitmore for um, negotiations, because we will be negotiating with our firefighters in fiscal year 18 and our police officers in fiscal year 19. And then uh, we'll be increasing uh, uh, just for next year for the general election. Our election costs are expected to be about $376,000. Uh, as I mentioned, we'll be making certain cuts to uh, discretionary line items to support um, our, our operational departments. Uh, in trying to close that budget gap, that general fund in particular budget gap. Uh, most of these will be from uh, training. Uh, so we'll see about $7,000 in total cuts to our citywide training programs. We think those we can absorb with little impact. Um, but we'll also see about $9,000 uh, in cuts to our, for our training for our professional staff. And as a, as a service department, uh, our departments rely on the professional expertise of our IT staff and our, and our human resources staff. So we'll have to get creative with how we use our, our training uh, dollars for that. Uh, but those are the cuts that we'll be making to support the general fund shortfall. Um, so key initiatives and objectives for fiscal year 18. Uh, we'll ha be negotiating with at least five of our labor groups, um, still in some talks with certain labor groups, so we may actually have one more there. Um, w in lean budget times, or in, uh, we tend to get shorter labor agreements, so we, we tend to cycle them through a little bit more quickly, so we're very busy in labor during those times. Um, and for the clerk, we're going to be focusing in the first part of the uh, uh, fiscal year to conduct the uh, 2017 general election. Um, and then we'll move on to electronic records management plan uh, and really getting our arms around uh, good record keeping systems for our ever growing uh, uh, stash of uh, electronic records. And that's a hot topic in clerk circles right now. Um, in human resources, we're going to continue to expand our popular core skill training for supervisors, and we'll be, the human resources will pay a lar large part in selecting a time and attendance system to automate our uh, employee time cards, employee scheduling, and employee attendance management, which is something we've been looking to do for a long time. If there are any no questions about the general fund operations, then... I just keep going, all right. <laughs> so we'll talk about our ICS fund operations, which includes both our, our operations and our capital program for uh, 2018. In fiscal year uh, 2017, we'll underspend our budget, uh, including significant salary and benefit savings due to turnover at the beginning of the year, the retirement of Raj, Rob Badger, our information systems manager, and sort of the cascading uh, re replacements as we promoted Marianne Knight uh, resulted in that. In fiscal year 18 operations, we will uh, see a reduction in hourly staffing. We're going to eliminate an hourly staff member, which will offset the increases to salaries and benefits we'd otherwise see. We'll be increasing our supplies and services by about $30,000, which will also be balanced by changes in other line items. And uh, we'll make the second of two uh, loans to uh, community development and public works for the Acela um, permitting uh, software, which they had wanted to purchase. We had loaned them from the IT fund, the capital fund, a little bit of money. And we'll be uh, making the second loan from that and then start to gradually recoup that through their IT service charges through the rest of the year. Um, so that's operations. Uh, our amended capital program for, you can see we, it looks like we significantly underspent uh, our budgeted capital um, for uh, FY17. That's inflated a bit because it included the purchase costs for our Acela uh, Tidemark permitting uh, software system as well as our um, uh, uh, cartograph system, which is the work order system for a lot of our operational 
um, operations. Um, so the, the, it looks like it's inflated, but we actually will spend that uh, as, we, as we continue the implementation into the beginning of FY18. Um, in our fiscal year 2018 capital plan, you see it goes down significantly. That is uh, just our normal infrastructure replacement. We, we regularly replace um, our infrastructure, our routers and our servers as they age out, as well as our desktops and computers, and we, we budget that for, for that each year in our capital program. So that'll be going down to a more uh, uh, normal level. Uh, our revenues will actually decrease next year. Um, we're going to put in some service charge reductions of 140000 uh, to departments, which is uh, uh, for infrastructure um, replacement. Uh, we charge them every year. Some uh, money for infrastructure replacement we will be reducing that next year to help with the budget shortfalls in some of those areas. Um, that's, uh, we'll also be increasing uh, the charges to departments to uh, pay for part of the administrative services director, my time. Um, and then we'll have some miscellaneous uh, adjustments to salaries and benefits, resulting in a total of 127,000 reduction in uh, revenues through service charges to departments. Um, just to go into a little bit more uh, detail on that, um, we'll be reducing the service charges to department for infrastructure replacement, and we're able to do that because we have um, started to transfer uh, the budget variance in our operations, IT operations, into capital every year. And what that's meant is that as we've had staff turnover and, and, and achieve salary savings and other savings in operations, we've put that into our IT capital uh, program. Um, and we've started to accumulate excess reserves. So for the near future, we did a projection that showed that we could reduce our charges to departments by using those uh, excess capital reserves to offset our uh, capital, our regular capital infrastructure replacement program. So we'll be doing that. Eventually, uh, those excess capital reserves will run out uh, and we'll have to bring that back up. But for the near future, we believe that we can sustain this uh, reduction in charges to departments. Um, and again, we included that's net of the 15% uh, of the um, admin services director, and um, we will also start to see repayment of the loans that we've made to community development and public works for the Acela project coming in next year. Um, major initiatives for fiscal year 2018 include the continued implementation of the Acela permitting system. People are very excited with where that's going. Uh, we'll be selecting a vendor for t the time and attendance program to allow us to um, get rid of those yellow timesheets that we fill out um, every uh, two weeks and get to an automated system, um, finally. Uh, and then uh, we'll be selecting a property management and accounts receivable system that's used for um, parking, uh, downtown parking primarily, and the airport both use uh, these systems to manage their properties. Um, we'll also be creating a disaster recovery plan um, and really getting a good plan uh, into place for if we were to have a disaster to make sure that we could get our systems quickly back online and ensure the integrity of our data. Um, in fiscal year 2019, I did want to highlight one um, project that we have slated um, because uh, um, Council Member Dominguez had brought it up a little while ago, but it is a constituent relationship management system. It's also called a CRM system. And uh, what a CRM system is, is a single point of contact for receiving and tracking customer requests. So customers can um, submit a question uh, or a service request either uh, through a desktop or through their uh, cell phone, and they can even uh, add a G GPS location for where the service is needed. Um, and requests can also be made into the system either in person by, through a staff member um, or by telephone. A staff member can log service requests into the same system. And then the requester or a staff member can always watch where that service request or question is in the process of being resolved. Um, so uh, they, customers can also um, sign up for notices and push notifications on projects or, or different areas of interest. Um, they can find information through the CRM system. It's a single point where they can find uh, frequently asked questions, forms, links to information they might need. 
Um, it'll integrate with some of our systems, for example, work orders, so that it'll talk to the work order system and then send information back on, on where uh, a project is in the work order flow uh, to the CRM system that the customer can then see. So it's pretty neat. Uh, the purposes of a CRM are to increase public engagement in uh, community management, uh, to provide 24-hour access to problem solving. I know I really appreciate that. Uh, and increase accuracy and transparency uh, of the service request workflow. Also to ensure timely responses to every contact and to provide analytics uh, to deploy resources more effectively for management. So we're excited about that project that will be coming through in 2019, 2000, excuse me. Yeah. So with that, that's Great. the end of my presentation. It's amazing you're still using paper time sheets. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Welcome to the 21st century. Thank you. <laughs> uh, Mr. Rouse. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, Mr. Schmidt, would the CRM system, or does it, would it dovetail with community development in terms of project tracking and permit, uh, permit uh, uh, status? Ideally it would, and in fact, Acela is one of the major providers of, of public CRM products. But yes, any, any system uh, should integrate with all of those major uh, um, workflow type uh, systems. Well, we could yell at a program now, cool. Mr. White. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, so reserves in the computer world, can you talk about that a little bit? Where is it? Uh, so we have about, uh, in, in we don't have, we only retain a 10% a reserve in our operations, and we transfer any excess reserves in operations above that 10% to capital. Uh, in the capital fund, we have about $600,000 now in uh, excess accumulated reserves, and that's what we're planning to tap over the next several. In total, or is in that total. excess? Okay. In total. Uh, no, that's it. That, sorry, that's in excess. Uh, so so what's, um, how much is in the base? I mean, is it 600,000? Is it, are we double what our normal year is? I believe it's about 350,000 is the um, required reserve that, we, that our projected required reserve to fund our capital program over the long term. And then um, that would be 600 above that? Above that, so yes. That, okay, yeah. thank you. I think that does it, so right. great. Thank you. Thank you. And I believe city attorney's office next. Great. Thank you, Madam Mayor. All Let right. me uh, get this uh, queued up. Um, Leanne, if you started, I think I can run it from here. Thank you. Well, this is uh, more than about numbers. Uh, this is really an opportunity to communicate a sense of vision about how we're going to accomplish what you want to accomplish. And um, so it's an important time for us. I want to start by thanking Mr. Casey. Um, he's created uh, what I think of as creative, capable, and innovative departments. And that's really crucial to us because it's built a foundation for restructuring and rebuilding what we do, which is part of the sense of vision. I also want to thank Leanna Pensek. Uh, I have worked hard with Leanna since I arrived three years ago. She's really developed from being a legal assistant to uh, a full-on supervisor with day-to-day -day intensive supervision of the four support staff that report to her, as well as learning day-by-day uh, -day how to deal with the budget. And those are both major tasks, and I thank her for her work. So <clears throat> one objective we have is to do what we do as efficiently as possible. And I think we've squeezed out as much efficiency as we can in our organization. So the next step has to be doing what we do in a different manner if we're going to ga gain efficiencies. So we're doing it the old way as well as you can do it. Now it's time to start doing it the new way. And that's kind of a fundamental theme in what we're going to talk about. <laughs> Part of that relates to uh, teaching our clients how to be prudent consumers of legal services. Sometimes in organizations, the people who need legal help <clears throat> are really quite passive. 
They will ask you to solve a problem. And that's one way to, to get results. But the system works better if the people using the lawyers know how to buy those services, know how to integrate themselves with the lawyers to make them uh, more efficient. So part of this is creating core competencies in the departments for how best to use lawyers. And use is the operative word. We are there to be used, and that's uh, really a crucial theme in the office. Okay, uh, let's see if this works. Yes. Okay. So this is our proposed programmatic structure. One, you'll recall that one of the first things I did was break up our budget into four pieces that try and reflect what we do. Why that lets us understand whether we're spending our money in the right places to accomplish what you want us to do. Administration, and the 13.75 up there, by the way, reflects uh, 2.75 new positions that we are requesting this year. Administration is about 10% of what we do. Uh, that's a pretty light number. It's a higher number for Leanna and myself, but for the rest of the staff, they're engaged less in, less in administration and more in delivering services directly. Our advisory works around 38%, 39%. I've commented on this before, that's a low number. I'd like us to be doing more advisory work. Instead, we are doing 38% advisory and 43, 44 litigation. So we're in a time when the demands on the office are really being created externally through litigation. And that, of course, makes it tough to meet all the internal demands as well. So I think that's it's a little lopsided. I'd like that to change. Finally, we're only about 8% uh, uh, into code enforcement. It was around 9% last year. Uh, at your discretion over time, you may choose to increase or decrease that number. That's your policy control over how we do code enforcement. So this is the staff organization as opposed to the functional organization. The blue uh, represent the support services in the office, the green represent the legal services, and the green and red represent the new legal services that we're seeking. Specifically, we're looking for uh, an FTE to support water resources. We're looking for a quarter of an FTE to support the airport, half an FTE to support wastewater, and a full FTE to create a new position called City Attorney Investigator. And that is a position that will supplant money we're spending now through HR to conduct personnel investigations. We're going to do that in-house. There's some recent case law that makes it advantageous for us to do it in-house. Two, that's a position that will support code enforcement. Three, that's a position that will support litigation by being able to go out in the field or to other city offices to gather witness statements or documents. This is a bilingual position. One of the weaknesses in our organization, meaning my office, is that in this community with a very high percentage of Spanish speakers, we don't have that capability. That's got to change over time. Now, the other effect of adding staff the way we're doing it is to change the balance of the support staff in our office. Lawyers are more intensive users of administrative support than many other professionals, meaning we make good use of assistance and it helps our efficiency. When I came in and as of now, about 45% of our staffing is on support. That's excessive by any measure. What we're doing by bringing in the additional staffing without any additional support is to reduce our support overhead down from 45 to 36%. So this is moving the office in the direction that uh, I had hoped to do when I first came in and gave you my organizational review. Um, I think it's going to work. I have to balance my own sense of how many support people we need by the reality that unlike a law firm, we don't have a word processing center, we don't have a file clerk, we don't have a mail room. Um, so our support staff are doing it all. And uh, 
I still think that they can handle the growth that we're asking for. <clears throat> okay, overview. You know about the office uh, space expansion because you've authorized and we've concluded a lease for about uh, 1,700 square feet next door to us at 740 State Street, that's suite 202. For the time being, we're moving into that as a trial and uh, that means we're gonna try and spend as little money as we can in effecting that move so that if the expansion turns out not to be as efficient as we hope it to be, we can pull the plug and reduce in-house staff, go back to a contract model without that office space. I mentioned the allocation of the new staffing and I mentioned the city attorney investigator already. Uh, the, one of the reductions we have is in outside council funding. So we're hoping to replace some of what we're spending on outside lawyers with these inside staff. Now, in terms of the details of the expenditures, one of the um, kind of computations, and by the way, I'm at page G58. I should have mentioned that earlier. One of the internal computations here is um, uh, around what our cuts are. So I mentioned we're cutting professional services about $24,000. We are also experiencing reductions in that community development had been giving us about 35,000 a year to support the new zoning ordinance work. As that's coming to an end, that money's going away. Finally, the council in the last two years has made special allocations for vacation rental enforcement of about $80,000. That's going away. So the total reduction for us is around 139,000. Of course, the net budget is an increase because of the new positions. Now, I want to add a caveat. Because of the timing of the office space deal, and you know very well how that went, we don't have all the new staffing costs in this budget. There are going to be, uh, I would say, incidentals, but they're more than incidental. There will be computers and software licenses and things like that. So don't be shocked if we're back asking for some money in the next six weeks. Public Works is pricing all of that stuff out for us right now. On the revenue side, there's some important changes happening as well. Right now, if you look at the ratio between uh, our budget and the general fund subsidy, which is reflected up on that slide, we're currently supported about 72% by the general fund. So we're a heavy general fund user of cash. <clears throat> the projected uh, general fund subsidy for this year now is going to be 77%. <clears throat> what happens in FY18 with the addition of the positions? Our general fund subsidy drops to 56%. And that's because the new positions are going to be funded directly out of the enterprise funds. Now there's a special accountability that goes with that that I'll get to in a minute. So, I, I, and it's an accountability not only to the uh, uh, enterprise fund customers, it's an accountability to the council and taxpayers as well. So we'll talk about that a lot. By FY19, we're down to about 55% general fund subsidy. Now th those numbers are exclusive of anything we can recover in code enforcement. I have, uh, expectations that we will uh, increase our recoveries through code enforcement. <clears throat> okay, uh, program highlights. I, you, I mentioned already we're cut up into four operating divisions. Let's talk about all of them. <clears throat> On the administrative side, we completed our second citywide customer survey. Customer service surveys are crucial because they make the lawyer accountable to her clients. All right, that accountability is often missing in public agencies. It's crucial from an organizational dynamic standpoint that we return that accountability. You teach the client how to be a choosy customer and you make sure that you're satisfying them. Those are very, very important. Uh, secondly, I pulled out a process I developed many years ago that I've dubbed collaborative legal budgeting. We'll talk about that a little more, 
but it's a way of uh, collaborating with the operating departments in deciding what kind of legal service they're going to need. So let's go on. The customer service survey results are pretty consistent. They were slightly higher last year at about 4.38 out of 5. Uh, in 2017, it's down a bit to 4.08 out of 5, but it's well within the standard deviation of those numbers. So if I were a statistician, I'd tell you those are the same numbers. Uh, my perception is that the number's slightly down because we had slightly less participation in the survey this year than last. And secondly, uh, uh, familiarity does breed some contempt. So it's natural to expect a slight decline in the second year. Last year, you, last year you will recall that we used the customer survey results to change our practice by adding an annual legislative report to our portfolio. The clients were asking us to give them more advance notice of changes in the law. We did that. Now, this year the results tell me a couple of things. One, faster is better. There is more concern about timeliness from us than there was last year. Um, I think part of that was that, uh, honestly, this is a very uh, collaborative and nice organization. So it's taking some time to get people to really tell us what they think and need. And that honesty is crucial. So I think they're, they're being more articulate now about, you know, faster is better. We're worried about delays. Secondly, we added some open-ended questions to the survey this year, and the staff want more training. That's a really good thing because uh, draining the swamp, so to speak, happens by us sharing our legal burden. How do we do that? We create expert consumer clients by teaching them about these areas of the law. That takes work off of us, and it helps them formulate their questions more effectively. So where we're going to go this year is to create more organized training sessions. We've done a fair amount of it in the past, but not as an organized educational program. So where the staff have identified interest is public records. Footnote on public records, it is a sleeping giant hidden in this budget. We spend an enormous amount of effort, Mr. Casey will confirm, dealing with public records requests. The state law is built in a way that forces the city to absorb those costs. Uh, Ms. Schmidt mentioned the electronic records management. Uh, she's asked me to participate in that, and I intend to. The goal is that with an ideally structured records management system, we don't have to spend as much time finding and reviewing information before we pump it out to the public. We should build an organization that wants to pump out as much information to the public as it possibly can. That's valuable to the economy. It helps people do whatever they do as a business faster and more efficiently when they can get the information that we have. Think of it as, for example, the federal crop reports or Bureau of uh, uh, Labor Standards reports. All of that information stimulates the economy. So just as a conceptual matter, uh, treating public records obligations as a positive thing for the community really makes a lot of sense, but we've got to learn to do that. They are interested in more board and commission training, and they're interested in understanding employee discipline, and discipline is a poor synonym for performance management. Now, how are we going to get faster is better? I mentioned that we've squeezed out as much efficiency out of doing things the way we've always done them, and I'll of course, we're all going to tumble to the quip that the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over and expecting different results. So in the legal profession, uh, certainly in the uh, governmental side of the legal profession, it's high time that we change the way we do what we do. How are we going to get there? Um, number one, books are going away out of our office. We will eliminate the standard reporters that are more easily available and searchable on my computer. We will retain some of the specialty books that uh, are not so available electronically or that are cost prohibitive electronically. So you're going to see a lot of books leaving our office. Number two, uh, you know, 
you know that we've uh, added a legal database in the last couple of years. That's really helping our efficiency. But to make full use of it, the lawyers need to be really computer centric and they need to be portable. So portability is, is really crucial in this respect. Uh, right now, we operate this way. We get a work request through a pretty well-designed work request system. The lawyer contacts the client within 48 hours, finds out information and when they need it, and then they go do the work. Now, to get that done, most work projects are cooperative, collaborative things. You don't send a lawyer off to, to build a desal plant or to write a contract for a desal plant. You send a lawyer out to collaborate with the staff to understand what they need and, and develop it. Well, right now that happens through a series of 20 meetings. And if you're lucky at the meetings, people assign what needs to be done and there's follow-up. But the process drags on and on and on. So today, the lawyer's day is typically divided up into five to 20 slices of work. That's very different than most private practitioners. When I was in private practice, I would do three, four things a day. Here I do 15, 20 routinely. There's a natural loss of efficiency when you're shifting from subject A to subject B 20 times a day. There, it takes time for your brain to recycle. It takes time for you to find the material that you were working on. So the way we get around that in the future is task-based teamwork. What I envision and what I've discussed with the department heads is that our lawyers will all be equipped with uh, very small laptops, two-pounders. Those machines will be their desktop, just like this is my desktop computer. I, I walk it over here and plug it in again. I don't have a separate computer. So all of us will be portable. IT has set up a wonderful network here so that you can log in from any public web access point, any public Wi-Fi, and tunnel in through VPN to your desk and have everything you need. So our legal database is available in Timbuktu if you have the privileges to get to it. What I envision is that rather than the work comes in, the lawyer calls, they set up meetings, they go back and forth nine times, is that we create uh, task-based teamwork. What does that mean? You need a smoking ordinance? I can get it to you in six weeks if I do it the old way. That might take 20 hours of lawyer time. Why not lock up the lawyer in a room with the client and say, look, you've got 24 hours over the next three days to get this done. I'll buy you dinner. Uh, go get it done. Ignore the phone. Do your job in a focused, concise way. I really believe that that's a transition that needs to be made. I also think that's a transition that needs to be made to accommodate millennials and the change in the way people operate now than when we did. For example, office space was a status symbol for a lot of us, corner office. Uh, it's less relevant to young people. The, the place they are wants to be social they like the openness. They like the opportunity to collaborate. So I think that having portability for them to do their work wherever they are or to have a work table in the office where four people sit down and with their computers and do what they've got to do uh, addresses the needs of the next generation of lawyers. That's been my experience and that's, that's my belief. The department heads uh, have I've raised this with them. They appear all willing to set aside some kind of uh, uh, open space for us to come camp in for these kinds of projects, or the clients can come to us. So that's a, that's a fundamental change. And it's more social by design. Having the distance between the lawyers and clients doesn't serve anybody. It simply creates resentment. I call it the Coke machine syndrome. The, the most frustrating thing is the perception that the client wants to drop a nickel in the city attorney's office door and get an opinion spit out. That's, that's not the way it works. So 
what's going on here is that with uh, 25 years of World Wide Web experience and maybe 20 years of email experience, we have depersonalized the way we work with each other to a greater stent, extent than is valuable. So this is putting back into the system human interaction. What we use machines for is to do the repetitive routine work that you don't want somebody reinventing every time they do it. So the machinery, the portable computers, the legal database is there to save time and what you do with that free time is you be creative. Creativity is not something that just happens. You have to make time for it. And that, that's a key goal of trying to squeeze out a bit more efficiency through this portable approach to, to law practice. So enough, n enough about that. Uh, okay, collaborative legal budgeting. I do want to introduce this very, very briefly. So historically, the city attorney's office comes up with a budget and performance goals that bear no relationship to what the departments are doing. You've heard it from me before. What I do is very rarely important. What I do that is important is help you with your operating departments deliver the widgets that we deliver to our customers, whatever those may be, whether it's parks and recreation, police services, fire services. So my value is in facilitating the creation of product for the public. I, on the enforcement side, I do have some independent responsibilities, but I'm putting that aside for the moment. So um, collaborative legal budgeting is a way of matching legal services to the needs of the department in the creation of widgets. They've never thought that way. We've never thought that way. So you have to create a forum for doing that. This year what we did was meet with every department and the key project managers and ask them to identify their top five projects over the next year. The, the ones that uh, the council's going to care about, the ones where the eyes of Texas are upon you. Uh, so we wanted to get a sense of what's important, why. I don't want to find out in September that there's a massive new leasing program happening at the airport and I haven't put aside resources to deal with that. I become the bottleneck at that point. I don't want to do that. So the collaborative legal budgeting budgeting is a way of communicating with the clients to really understand what their needs are going to be so that we can support their legal needs in a timely, capable way. It also involves client choice. I, I am insistent that the city departments understand that the city attorney's office is one way to get the work done. They can also spend money to buy outside lawyers and in some instances, that's a better decision to make. They need my help in making that decision, my being the city attorney's office, but it's an okay decision to make. It doesn't reflect on us. So that teaching that mindset is, is really important. So what, what we did this year, uh, and you'll see in this table, with Mr. Casey's support, we pulled out of the department budgets the money they're spending on lawyers that in the past had been uh, not transparent to the public, not transparent to me. Uh, and so what you see up there is that we're spending somewhere between 15 and 20 percent of the city attorney's office budget. Uh, we're spending an additional 15 to 20 percent of our budget on outside lawyers that have never been accounted for. What we did this year was plan for those expenditures so that the tools, the lawyers, will be there when they need them. Now, promoting accountability is really a, a key issue here, too. I touched on it already, talking about the person-to-person -person accountability of the lawyer to the client, that uh, my success doesn't matter if you're not successful, that facilitating a department's success is important to me. Uh, our office has grown quite a bit. I, I'm confident that everybody in the office is working at 100% or more. 
and they want to be valued for that. So the way to do it is to connect them back to the clients. How do we do it? Our legal database also includes timekeeping. So in terms of the enterprise funds, in uh, asking uh, Hazel Johns and Rebecca Bjork to support our legal work with direct funding, I promised accountability to them in a couple of ways. Uh, primarily, we will be providing them monthly billing statements, time reports, uh, at quarter hour intervals of what we did to earn that enterprise fund money. That also serves to educate them about who's asking us what. Do I really want, you know, Johnny or Susie nine layers down in the organization sending massive projects to the departments? I've had many conversations with department heads where I said, geez, I didn't want them to do that. Uh, you know, they, I know how to do that. I already know. Let the supervisors who have this experience with the law answer those questions to trim them off of us. So th that accountability uh, through monthly time reports is really, really crucial. And finally, this table here is an effort to publicly report all of our legal costs. So this is very consistent with what I talked to you about three years ago. And it's the next step in putting that plan into action to really remake how we're providing legal services. Okay, what did we do this last year? Uh, obviously, a lot of major projects on the advisory side, the tax measure for uh, marijuana, oversized vehicles, infrastructure tax work is ongoing, DSAL, new zoning ordinance, LCP update, to name a few. Lots of very weighty uh, and important stuff that we've done reasonably well on. I'm not sure that we've been timely on every piece of it, but uh, that's why we're trying to change. On civil litigation, we have a zero loss litigation goal, and that means don't lose any cases. Uh, we met that this year. One minor exception, uh, we lost a small claims case. We're not allowed to appear on those small claims cases. It was a weird decision. It was like 8000 bucks. so that will happen once in a while. But the way you avoid losses is to use your head and settle the cases that need to be settled and fight the winners. That's what we're trying to do. We got the Supreme Court to give us review in Jax. That was a major coup. I'm very, very proud of that. That was not an easy thing to do after what the Court of Appeal did to us. We should get results this month. We defended the existing RV rules in the Court of Appeal. That process informed a lot of the legal advice I gave you on the oversized vehicle uh, work. We are currently defending Mr. Cracky's challenge to the short-term vacation rental regulations. We are expecting to uh, hear from the trial court in Ventura in the next day or two whether our second demur will be sustained without leave to amend so that uh, Cracky needs to go to the Court of Appeal. And uh, we'll, we'll see how that comes out. And finally, we continued our work on the Refugio oil spill. More on that will be coming to you next uh, Tuesday. Code enforcement and criminal, criminal prosecution. With your support at the beginning of this fiscal year, we got heavily into housing enforcement. You all know about that. Uh, it's hard work, but it's good work. There is a constituency out there that is underserved in that area. I think consumer protection, in addition to housing enforcement, is an area where I'd like to grow when we have the time and money to do it. Um, Consumer protection, given what's going on in D.C., uh, is increasingly falling on state and locals to, to do. And there are many examples of successful consumer protection programs. We've been eating the elephant on short-term vacation rental, and that's what it is. We have, I have dozens of files open, and uh, CD's done a wonderful job working that. Um, and we'll, we'll continue. So that's all I've got. I would love to answer any questions. If not. Great. We do have some questions. Mr. Hotchkiss. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you, sir.
Great report. Um, the vacation rentals, do we need to put more people on the enforcement or, or not? Because I mean, there are an awful lot out there. They're just kind of ignoring what we're trying to do. That's a policy choice for you. I will say this. Um, the addition of dedicated resources for water resources, wastewater, and the airport will in turn free other resources. So, for example, having that bilingual city attorney investigator is going to let me get a lot more information more quickly in more specialized ways than perhaps the CD staff is able to do. So I'm not ready to ask for more uh, money in that area. If you would like a report in 90 days, you know, we'll see. I am hesitant also because uh, this cracky litigation is, is important. What we have not done is follow through with the Airbnbs, VRBO, HomeAways of the world in pressuring them. We did get Airbnb to change its website to properly recognize that Santa Barbara does not allow vacation rentals in most instances, uh, but we have not pressed them for customer records yet, and um, that's a strategic call. And you mentioned the bilingual. That doesn't have to do with vacation rentals, though, right? Uh, it, it does, because uh, there are people who have lost housing as a result of vacation rentals that may not be English speaking. I see. Okay. Um, you mentioned that books are going away. Is that true in the uh, private world as well as the public world here for, for legal purposes? It's truer in the private world than here. We've been. Uh, uh, you know, books look, I, I like books, you know, that's the way I was brought up. So this is letting go of something. And the law firms have been faster to do that. Um, the the uh, whole sort of different way of working that you're trying now, how are you going to evaluate that? Because to, to some degree, these things come and go. IBM used to have people always working at home. Now they're reversing course because they see it isn't successful. I'm not implying that with what you're saying, but... It, it may work in some ways, it may work in every way. How are we going to know, or how are you going to know? Two ways. First, I'm not proposing that people work at home more. I'm proposing... No, no, it's, I was just doing yeah, a barrel. Uh, so the way we'll know it's effective is, frankly, a morale question. I think if the clients think it's working well, that'll be a good measure. If the lawyers deliver product in the time frame I think they can do it, that will be effective. So we'll report on that uh, initially anecdotally, and then given the timekeeping capability we have now, um, I can give you more quantitative information later on. One of the things that timekeeping does that's really important is build a skill that most public lawyers don't have. Private lawyers think in terms of tenths of hours, and they are able to estimate how long it's going to take them to do something and what it's going to cost. Most public lawyers can't do that. By pushing my staff to keep time, those who don't have a private practice background will develop the skill to estimate how long. So if I say you get 16 hours over two days to get the job done, they'll, they'll tell me, no, I need, you know, I need 30 to do that. Last question. Um, there are some areas that require specialty law, for instance, as I understand it, dealing with the FAA. Are we going to continue to, are we going to try to do that in-house or will we use outside sources? I've described to you in the past, the, I have four warrants. I love Derek Bailey's lingo. So uh, like traffic warrants, I have four warrants for hiring outside counsel. Number one is specialized expertise that doesn't make sense to develop in-house. That's probably where the FAA falls. Number two is when you need marquee talent because of the importance of the case. Uh, Mike Colantuno on Jax, that's marquee talent. I'm getting it at a bargain rate, but it's still marquee talent. Number three is conflict of interest, which happens rarely. Uh, that could happen, for example, if there were a need to get involved with a council member over some misconduct. And fourth is overflow, and you try and have as little overflow as possible. You try and predict what your base load's going to be. So yes, you're right. FAA is something that we would probably continue to contract out. Last question. Will we get a, a report on the Cracky case soon? 
Yes, and I'm hoping it's good news. Thank you, Mr. Ms. Maria. Thank you, Mayor Schneider. So you were you talked about an abundance of public records requests. What do they ask for? I mean, just generally. It's easier to say what the purposes are. Okay. Um, the, the leading purpose is probably related to a business project that the individual wants to get involved with. And they're trying to understand the back, background to do the due diligence that didn't happen last night. Uh, the number two category is muckraking. They're looking for corruption or waste, and that's legit. And the, the number three category is uh, secret litigation support. So it's advanced work by lawyers and law firms to get information outside of the discovery process to frame a case against us. And you mentioned enforcement, thank you. You mentioned enforcement a little bit and the, the uh, Peeney, um portfolio, I don't even know what to call it. Uh, is that ramping down or? Uh, uh, no, actually not. The, the um, uh, Judge Stern upheld our unfair practices complaint, which we filed with the authorization of the district attorney so we are preparing for trial in the unfair practices action. That's the consumer protection action that has substantial fines associated with it. One feature of that law is that the fines or penalties are dedicated 50-50 to the DA and to the city attorney for consumer protection purposes. Uh, Mr. Casey and I have discussed what qualifies as consumer protection it doesn't necessarily need to be a legal service. So that would be a source of funds if we're successful that we can use for future consumer protection actions. The second front on Mr. Peeney is um, the possibility of a health and safety code receivership action. That's a, case, that's a situation where the court appoints a third party to take control of the property, uh, take control of the uh, cash register, and do what needs to be done either by borrowing on the property or using rental income to renovate the property. That, that uh, uh, I can't really comment on, on further in that, public. That's okay. Yeah, I, I, and just in the context of the budget discussion, it, it, is there, there's cost recovery, right, for, for that work? Yes. Okay, okay. And then I just wanted to say I do support um, bilingual staff as much as possible. Um, and your projects with deadlines that I mean when I was a reporter that's how we worked right that's all we did was just get this thing out so I really appreciate what you're saying and um, it sounds like you have a plan to monitor and do adaptation if some of your creative um, um, your new format the way you're doing things if it if it's not working so well you're you know you're ready to switch gears and so I really, I really appreciate your um, presentation today, Mr. Kalan. Well, thank you. I do want to say uh, again, none of what I'm suggesting could happen without the city administrator's support. So that's been a partnership that has really facilitated doing what we're trying to do. Great. Mr. Hart. Yeah, I just want to echo um, Councilmember Maria's uh, support for what you're doing because I think it's very thoughtful and it's strategic and I don't really have any questions about it because you explained it extraordinarily well and it makes sense the departments you know in previous um, evaluation periods have expressed an interest in having more direct conflict contract um, connection with your office and, and greater resources available directly for their specific projects to move that stuff forward and I think you're addressing this in a really great way to do it. Um, one thing that caught my eye in your presentation was the talk about um, additional consumer protection options and I'm intrigued with that. That was sort of something I thought we were going to get to in the just caused eviction conversation at the council level. I thought that was sort of part A and part B was the rent stabilization and other issues but the other part of that was the consumer protection element. So maybe there's a moment in time this upcoming year or, or in the future to revisit at that and have that be a council discussion because I think that is a real need in the community and as you identified having the resources through this process dedicated to that could make a big difference in people's lives I'll just uh, oh go ahead mr. white I just, well, uh, 
I appreciate the um, pulling out of the legal costs that other departments have had. I'm not quite clear it, is at this point, is that that money is not headed into your budget increase, but you simply have identified that and hope to chew on that as you develop this new uh, structure? Correct. In discussing with the departments, I said that I have no need to control that money. Uh, keep it in your budget, but let's account for it. And so, uh, and then just uh, your hope would be that that there that that external legal cost would go down, or that the money would you be would it be your office that would be billing for that money uh, at certain to accomplish the tasks that were hoped for, that were expected to be needing those legal services? I don't know whether it'll go down. The, the, it's a question of whether the outside counsel are warranted. And uh, again, it's just crucial that there be customer choice in whether to use us or somebody else. They've got to have that in order not to feel boxed in. It's just crucial. No, I, I appreciate all of that, I, I, and I also... Uh, well, there are some areas... Okay, so let me, let me elaborate slightly. There, there are some areas that we evaluated that are not cost-effective right now. For example, workers' comp. We could, workers' comp is form book stuff. It's well within our competency to develop that. But what we pay on the outside is dirt cheap. So the cost differential between our time hourly and the outside lawyers is not enough to make it worth buying off the space and hiring people to do that. So there, there are areas where it's going to make sense to continue spending outside. Well, definitely in, for example, the area that I've worked on the one, perhaps the most over the last couple of years is water. And water, you're seeing special outside counsel all over the place, and usefully so, because that's their core competencies and uh, expertise. So I, I totally get that. But uh, anyway, I want to share the, the, the comments that others have made about uh, your coming at this, uh, eff this, this task creatively. And, and thank you uh, both. Thank the, the full administrative team for, for being willing to, to take it on. I'll just echo my colleagues' comments. Um, it, it appears the first three years here, you've been able to assess and then evaluate and um, restructure, right, where your department is in a number of ways, and that's, we're sort of at a next stage um, of where the, where the office, where you want the office to go, and especially, I think, with the new lease of the office space, especially you have another three years to figure out if that's, if that's the right formula or the right spacing options. You're going to need a new home page for your um, department with no books in them. Uh, but that also is going to free up a lot of space, I think, in your office and give you some flexibility. Uh, so that next chapter, I think, in your department is going to be exciting to see. So uh, appreciate, appreciate your work there. Um, OK, we will move on to the city administrator and mayor and council's office. Just to let you know, I have to, I have to leave at 11, so don't rush on my occasion. Um, actually, Mr. Rouse is next on the pecking order with the mayor pro tem here. The ordinance committee chair <laughs> is next, so he'll take over if I have to go. But oh, so he says do, no. But, uh, but thank you very much. So um, Ms. Johnston or Mr. Casey, whoever is taking over. Thanks. Good morning, Madam Mayor and Council Members. My name is Nina Johnson. I'm the Senior Assistant to the City Administrator, and I'm going to be presenting our, the budget for the City Administrator's Office and the Mayor and Council's Office. So I'm going to be covering our revenues and expenditures, proposed budget adjustments, and then the work plan for the upcoming year. First, starting with the City Administrator's Office, uh, this office consists of two programs, and I'm going to run through uh, quickly the city administrator's office, our general management and administration function, and then city TV. And we have 8.3 uh, full-time FTEs, our full-time equivalents, and then three hourly employees in city TV. If we look at our revenues, we get half of our funding from the general fund, and then 42% from uh, overhead allocation to city departments, and then 10% of our budget is coming from service charges. This is for city TV, uh, service charges that are coming from our enterprise funds for special productions, uh, PSAs for trash and recycling, the airport, uh, a number of different areas that we have special 
uh, we receive revenue for special services from uh, a long-standing agreement with the city of Goleta for taping services, that's about 25,000. And then we also have over 100,000 in peg fee re revenue, and I'm gonna cover that in a moment. And that also, that's coming from our cable bills, that's going to city TV equipment. Altogether, we have a total budget of 2.2 million proposed for next year. Taking a look at the expenditure side, 75%, uh, 74% in salaries and benefits. Um, supplies and services at 19%. A lot of that is our allocated costs. So our allocated costs are, are citywide expenses that are shared by all uh, departments. We all share the cost. So examples, uh, telephones, our facilities, and so forth. We also have our professional services, the city's contribution for our regional South Coast Task Force on Gangs, uh, the, the, that amount is in there as well. Special projects, 27,000, that includes uh, funding for sustainability projects, the Green Business Program, uh, and other environmental memberships that we pay for on behalf of different city departments, Earth Day expenses city TV equipment, and then uh, debt services also shows up uh, in your guide, in your budget document as you're looking through. And this was uh, amount, an amount that was advanced for the city TV replacement project that we just finished. Uh, and I'm gonna cover that in a moment. To balance our budget, we uh, eliminated a vacant position, the administrative analyst position that was uh, previously Kate Wan, uh, that provided analytical support to our office. So that saved 134,000 or so, uh, distributed some of those funds. Um, we've also re reduced, proposed to reduce close, our closed captioning budget by 16,000. Uh, City TV staff has been looking at uh, a few different services that are starting to be used by other cities, larger companies to automate uh, voice, our voice to text captioning and basically start captioning all of our meetings instead of just the council meeting. So uh, staff is gonna be going out to bid uh, for an automated or live service to, to see what uh, proposals come back for that type of service. Um, I also wanna mention that I mentioned the city of Goleta that um, we don't have revenue, we've no, we're no longer taping for the city college monthly meetings, so uh, we don't have the revenue of 12,000 for next year. I mentioned the PEG fee on, for cable services earlier. PEG stands for Public Education and Governmental Access Fee. That's projected to generate about 132,000 for city TV equipment. So it's a 1% fee on our cable services. Half of that goes towards city TV and the other half goes towards community access, TVSB. And this is for equipment only, not for operational needs. Through this revenue, we were able to recently complete the city TV equipment replacement project. So we converted all of our equipment, these meeting room cameras, our control systems, all the related TV infrastructure from analog to digital. Um, so that was at a total cost of 587,000, all paid through the PEG fee funds. And I mentioned just so that we could complete the full project at once and not do it in a piecemeal approach, we even advanced a little bit of funds from the general fund to be paid through these upcoming year PEG fee funds so we could get that project taken care of uh, in full. So, and that project was uh, successfully completed. Looking at our work plan for the upcoming year, preparing a balanced budget for next year, uh, reviewing performance status reports from departments and submitting an annual report to council, updating our legislative platform of all of council's positions and sending uh, letters of support and advocacy on federal and state issues, coordinating citywide sustainability efforts, uh, we have a number of communication activities in our office and media relations, social media. We issue a weekly electronic newsletter, <clears throat> the City News in Brief each week, a quarterly business newsletter. The City News in Brief is now uh, reaching 15,000 people, so it has a pretty broad reach. Um, quarterly business newsletter is going to about 5,000 subscribers, so there are a lot of people who are reading about news items through those channels. We're also <clears throat> preparing this, we'll also prepare the State of the City presentation. 
For a few years, we've been working on a number of efforts to improve informational resources for entrepreneurs to start and grow their businesses, working with the business community. Uh, we developed a lot of online resources. This year, our efforts have really ramped up with a focus on the downtown area, uh, with the rise in online sales and uh, the shift to our, 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 the state of retail is, is changing so quickly. Um, we're hearing a lot of community concerns, and we have a really long list of different efforts that we are uh, following up on, uh, taking an active role in looking at different projects and really rethinking our, our approach uh, when it comes to State Street issues, participating in a lot of different community efforts, working with stakeholders, and so forth. Um, and I have a few different projects here that I've, I've listed. Uh, first, working with downtown Santa Barbara, as you know, for a few decades, we've had in place business improvement districts downtown. And those improvement districts focus on marketing and promotional services. And we're really hearing an interest in enhanced services downtown and setting something up uh, that's similar to Long Beach, Pasadena, Santa Monica, a property-based improvement district. So downtown Santa Barbara is initiating a feasibility study for uh, f working with a consultant to start a feasibility study to, uh, to look into uh, forming a property-based assessment district. We've budgeted half of the cost in, in, our, in our upcoming year's budget for what would be the second phase of their feasibility study. So they've already raised funds uh, to start that feasibility study if they decide to move forward and officially initiate uh, a new improvement district, we would have funds available to help get, uh, finish the feasibility study. And the way this could work is those funds could be advanced to them so that if the assessment district comes together and is formed, we could include those funds in the first year of their assessment revenue so that uh, those funds are repaid back to the city. I mentioned we have received a lot of suggestions. There are a number of different uh, projects in play that we're, we're playing an active role in and also monitoring very closely. Um, transient issues, inform uh, the presence of uniformed officers, we've ramped up, uh, really stepped up police presence uh, downtown, the city's leases with Macy's and Paseo Nuevo. Um, we're looking at creative options for vacant uh, storefront spaces on State Street art installations, minimizing uh, vacancy uh, signage. We're also looking at art projects on State Street, uh, getting more sculptures back on State Street on the uh, sculpture pads. Uh, you may remember Steelhead Trout and a number of uh, different exhibitions uh, from previous years. Now we have the pianos on State each fall, but we really want to get more rotating uh, exhibits uh, back out downtown. We're starting to work with uh, the Museum of Art, Museum of Natural History, um, Squire Foundation, and Sarah, Sarah York Rubin is looking into putting together a proposal so we can get something uh, that will really add a fun element to the street. We're also proposing a project for the 101 State Street underpass. Um, we're looking at our, an art revitalization project and really, now that we have a lot of construction activity wrapping up on lower state, uh, improving the connection between the waterfront and downtown areas so that we draw pedestrians uh, up the corridor and make the underpass area a more in, uh, inviting destination, a place you really want to walk through and check out. Um, so what we've budgeted so far is 75000 in the general fund and 30000 from Measure A funds, 30000 for uh, some uh, lane restriping and traffic uh, traffic lane changes, but we're looking at an art project, active street elements, landscaping, uh, a new traffic reconfiguration, and staff has already started some of the pre-work uh, of looking at different traffic plan options there and our electrical plans and so forth. Um, also doing some cleaning work. Uh, so there are a number of, we have entrances that are coming from the in, from different places. We're, we're really trying to take a closer look at how do we make that area more inviting and safe. Um, and we're, we're wanting to put, to put together a public design workshop so that we can pull together artists, design professionals, downtown stakeholders, interested members of the public so that they can talk about different ideas for the underpass and really come up with something creative uh, and that people would want to visit, uh, people of all ages, uh, to move people through the, the corridor. 
And I started by mentioning our online resources. We're continuing to add to those uh, to help businesses understand uh, different parts of the city um, uh, with videos and, and so forth. Now I want to turn to the mayor and council's office. Uh, this is a quick snapshot of our staffing. Uh, one mayor and six council members and one executive assistant. Um, you can see our salaries and benefits in the blue. Uh, a few years ago, we added community, our, our arts and community promotions to the mayor and council's budget. So we have two different programs now in the mayor and council area. So two and a half million is going towards our arts and community promotions. Um, and we also have, so in, a lot of that is, is covered in the special projects area and supplies and services. By consolidating all of our different uh, arts funding from different departments, uh, we can really promote the arts uh, under one office. So we don't have any change in funding for arts organizations this year proposed. Um, it includes that two and a half million is including 1.3 million for Visit Santa Barbara for tourism promotion and marketing services. It also includes funding for our county art staff. Uh, Sarah York Rubin was, she had to leave this week, but unfortunately she can't be here. Um, it provides funding for our, our arts resources to the community, uh, putting together an arts symposium, uh, the disbursement of city arts funding. Um, we have 323,000 for events and festivals, organizational development funding, community arts funding. That's distributed to about 60 different organizations each year. We also have uh, our operational, I mentioned earlier, our capital funding that's coming through the PEG fee revenue, but we have in our budget also the operational funding for community access, 313,000. And then there are historic uh, community festivals that uh, through our office we provide funding for 317,000 for Old Spanish Days, Summer Solstice, the Film Festival, the Fourth of July Parade that's now under Pierre Clayson's Foundation, Visitor Information Center. Here in our work plan we're going to be um, the community arts workshop uh, we're managing that lease and as they draw to a close for some of their construction activity we're going to be looking at bringing back a long-term lease and starting to discuss that with council uh, administering all the arts contracts and funding that I, I already reviewed organizing an annual arts symposium and producing uh, the, uh, the city hall gallery space that uh, we walk by every day and then we've also started work on a new gallery space at the airport terminal uh, to help them with their public art. With that, that ends my presentation. Great, thank you. I'll just uh, add, I know I'll just keep banging the drum on this about a, the updated arts master plan and where does that fit? It's kind of disappeared from any list. Uh, it used to be in the community development, you know, long range planning, that wasn't the right place for it. Um, obviously it should fit in this budget here somehow, but, um, and I know there was staffing turnover in the arts department last year, so, you know, I know that's still somewhere out there that would somehow we need to incorporate. And I don't know if there's a budgetary line item for that or not ne necessary, or if that's just a work item. Um, Madam Mayor, and I would just mention that um, there's a larger effort for the creative communities uh, project uh, working through the Santa Barbara Foundation. They're convening a number of different stakeholders and Sarah York Rubin is very involved in that effort in different committees. So I think that has become the larger uh, arts master plan that they're working on. Okay, well, yeah. it's more about what is the city's role and vision like we had before. I mean, that's how we got to the community arts workshop. That was always like on a list, like as a, you know, and that happened or the performance art, you know, the performing arts district area and all the redevelopment that what happened there. So. You know, we have murals, we have, we have all these different components, but we don't really have a package of what this means for the city and what that economic development impact is. And I think that um, will help us in future grant funding for projects or just, you know, promotional activities with all the other um, various arts organizations and festivals that we have. So great having a community-wide conversation, but we still need to know what's the city's vision on that. And um, so somehow that, I think that still needs to occur. But, uh, Ms. Murillo? Thank you. Thank you, Madam Mayor. So I'm very interested in the proposed 
property improvement district uh, proposal. Uh, maybe not in this meeting, but I'd like to know the difference between a business improvement district and a property improvement district. And I will like to know what, um, is this coming from the downtown property owners? Uh, so we need to investigate that as well. Um, they're certainly gonna have to vote for an assessment. And um, as we've seen, uh, you really need to get uh, your, uh, the people being assessed on board and whatever you're planning uh, needs to um, uh, satisfy their needs, right? It has to be driven by the people who will be paying the assessment. Um, I'd like a breakdown, not necessarily here, of what the allocations to Old Spanish Day, Summer Solstice, and the 4th of July Parade, your list there, uh, Ms. Johnson. I'm kind of curious how we were breaking down that $317,000. Um, that, that's it, thank you very much. Um, Madam Mayor, Council Member Murillo, I don't have the breakdown just right on me. It's about 75,000 for film festival, 80 for uh, old Spanish days, uh, 4th of July or 4th of July parade, about 5,000. Um, 54,000 for the Visitor Information Center. Sorry, I'm rattling them off. Uh, <laughs> uh, and Solstice? My, and Solstice, I believe, is 50. I'll have to check. But I will give you the exact, uh, exact amounts. Thank you. Uh, and I, just really quickly, I wanted to address the earlier question that I, I think it's the property improvement district, it, that is really something that would add to the services that are currently provided. Uh, it, right now, the two districts that we have in Old Town and Downtown are limited by law to only marketing and promotional services. So the funds that are collect from the business owners uh, can only pay for marketing and promotional services. And now there's starting to be an interest from, uh, from a number of stakeholders and the conversations are starting to happen uh, with downtown Santa Barbara and their property owners to f start figuring out, okay, if we're interested in enhanced services that could include uh, security or retail recruitment and a number of other different ideas, uh, where are those funds going to be coming from? And they've had presentations from Long Beach, Los Angeles, Pasadena, Santa Monica, and really studied some of those models. So they're in preliminary discussions now and really we've just started planning in our budget for what that might be looking like as we move through the year. Thank you, Mr. Rouse, just a couple of more questions. So Ms. Johnson, did the um, business and professions code, it allows for a business improvement district and then a property improvement district laid over that? That's correct. Huh, okay, that's interesting. And um, the we pay, the Parks Department pays downtown organization to do landscaping. Is that how it works? And, and would that arrangement change? And maybe landscaping can be done by our city employees in the future? Mr. Mayor Pro Tem, Council Member Murillo. Uh, we're transitioning the management of the downtown plaza landscape contract with downtown Santa Barbara to downtown parking. So it used to be, traditionally, it was managed by the Parks Department, so I just want to clarify that for Thank you, you, that this year it's now going to be managed by Downtown Parking. But yes, for years, we have had a contract with Downtown Santa Barbara, and they provide the plaza maintenance. If they move towards a property-based improvement district, that might change that scenario. I, I don't know what the future will bring. In that I'll regard. be watching that carefully. Thank you. All right, very well. well. I've got lots of comments about that, but I'll refrain from commenting on the BID since I'm a BID paying member. However, I am um, very pleased to see the amount of attention being paid to the idea of a, the underpass, uh, the State Street condition in general as we get ready to pop open this Paseo uh, or the um, La Entrada to the, to the world as a gateway to Santa Barbara. It's going to be important that the Santa Barbara doesn't stop at the 101 that we can continue people through. So it looks like you've got some encouraging agenda items on your plate. Anybody else have any further questions or comments? Mr. Casey, I believe we're adjourned. Thank you.